right, good morning. It's good to see you all here this morning. It's beginning to look a lot like Christmas outside. And in about three hours, it's going to be beginning to look a lot like Christmas in here. Because I want to invite you to stick around after Sunday school. We're going to decorate the hall with boughs of... Anyway, um, and it'll be great. So if you'd like to stick around and help with that, it's a lot of fun. Let's move into our time of worship this morning. Our call to worship comes from the 18th Psalm. And uh, the Lord portrays himself to us as a wonderful Savior because we are people in need of saving. And w- really, one of, the, uh, one of the dangers that you and I have as people who need saving from all kinds of things, one of the dangers that we have is to go looking for somebody else to save us and to protect us, somebody who is not God. And so the Psalms and the Bible in general point us to God as the ultimate Savior, the ultimate Deliverer, the one in whom we can trust. And you really get a sense of that this morning from Psalm 18, the proper response to this wonderful, gracious God when the psalmist says, I love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my Deliverer, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. Do you get the the sense of the power and the majesty and the God is like a big castle that you can run into and find safety there? And, uh, And we thank him for that. So this is the God that we get to worship this morning, the God that we can love, the God who loves us, the God who protects us. There was a man once who stood up and began to complain about the kids these days (laughs) <laughs> they were lazy, and uh, their morals were crumbling, and there was just no way the really, I mean, you look at the kids these days, he said, and you think there's no hope for this world. And that man was Socrates, <laughs> and uh, a long, long time ago. Um, I am getting to the age where I sometimes, in my cynical moments, feel like Socrates. I'm old enough to be grouchy and think, oh, what in the world is the world coming to? And think of the kids these days. But the Lord has blessed us with wonderful young people that give me terrific hope, tremendous hope that God is at work. God is working even in the dark world to bring kids, young people to himself, to grow them into godly uh, young people who are going to love him and serve him. The uh, future of the church is in good hands because it's in Christ's hands and he is already doing wonderful work. So for our Advent reading, I thought this week and next week I'd feature some of our young people who the Lord is doing wonderful things in their life. And uh, so I'm going to ask my son and Sam Olson to come, and they're going to do the Advent reading this week. And we have a couple of guys lined up next week as well. So come and uh, share with us the Word of God and a little meditation. The meditation is an old one. The Word of God is even older. The people presenting it to you are, uh, are young, and they're delightful. So Sam, come. Jojo, come. And... and uh, Bring the word of God to us. All right, this is Isaiah chapter 9, verses 2 through 7. The people who walked in darkness have seen great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shined. You have multiplied the nation, you have increased its joy. They rejoice before you, as with joy at the harvest as they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden and the staff for his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you've broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the tramping warrior in battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. On 
On St. Bartholomew's Day in 1662, over 2,000 pastors in England were thrown out of their churches because they refused to comply with a new law which said ministers had to wear certain clothes and conduct their worship services in a certain way. This mass firing would become known as the Great Ejection. Some congregations gathered in nearby fields to hear their ministers preach. So in 1665, another law was passed known as the Five Mile Act which said a minister who had been fired in the Great Ejection could not live within five miles of his former church. One of these ejected ministers was a nam man named John Flavel, who once preached a series of 43 sermons on the life of Christ, which were compiled in a book called The Fountain of Life. Here is a little snippet of Sermon 18 entitled, Of the Necessity of Christ's Humiliation. The incarnation of Christ was a most wonderful humiliation because in it, God, who is over all, God blessed forever, was brought into the rank and order of creatures. It is an astonishing mystery that God should be manifest in the flesh, that the eternal God should truly and properly be called the man, Christ Jesus. It amazed Solomon that God would dwell in the stately and magnificent temple at Jerusalem. Will God indeed dwell with man on earth? Behold, heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain you. How much less this house that I have built? But it is far greater wonder that God should dwell in a body of flesh and pitch his tent with us. For the sun to fall from the sky and be degraded into a wandering Adam, or an angel to be thrown out of heaven and turned into a silly fly or a worm is not such a big thing, for they were only creatures before and would continue to be so. The distance between the, an angel and a worm, but for the infinite, glorious creator of all things to become a creature is a mystery beyond all human understanding. The distance between God and the highest order of creatures is an infinite distance. God is said to humble himself just to look at the things that happen in heaven. How great a humiliation it is then to look at the things in the world, but to be born into it and become a man. Great indeed is the mystery of godliness. Awesome. <clears throat> Wonderful. Thank you so much, Jojo and Sam. Appreciate you so very much. We have sung, I believe in the virgin birth. I believe in life eternal. We have just sung, Christ was born that man no more may die. Do you believe that? I mean, that's a remarkable thing when death is such a part of our experience and sickness and, uh, and the effects of sin on our world, we, we believe in something almost unthinkable. And we believe it because it has come to us through the Lord Jesus Christ. We we'll take a few moments to pray and we're going to come before our Lord who... Uh, hears us and sees us and sees us in our weaknesses. Uh, you have been receiving prayer updates throughout the week and, and, um, and, and some of those are significant and urgent and we, we certainly wish the Lord's grace on them. Uh, we're going to pray for our missionaries. We're going to pray for the gospel to go forth in, in great power. And we're going to ask the Lord... Uh, to bless us. So would you join me in prayer this morning? Our Heavenly Father, the herald angels sing glory to the newborn King. Father, would you open our hearts and open our spiritual eyes to see, to feel the wonder of God in flesh, born that man no more may die. Lord, forgive us for our 
blurry vision. Forgive us for our cold hearts that approach the Christmas season ho-hum about God becoming flesh. Lord, we are weak. We can't see the wonder of Christ very well. We need your spirit. Would you grant him to us? Would you enliven your word? Would you awake our hearts to the wonder of the virgin birth, life eternal, and in your holy church? What a marvelous God you are, and we praise you. Lord, we praise you even in moments when we wish you would intervene and you haven't, and so we come to you and ask for you to work on our behalf, to look upon us and be gracious to us. Lord, a number of us are sick, our friends, our loved ones are suffering under various diseases. Lord, there are some for whom death seems right at the door. And we want you to intervene on their behalf. You know their names. We've brought them before you. We bring them before you again and ask for your mercy. We pray for those with whom we have partnered to bring the gospel to other places, in other lands, to people that we can't reach out to. So we pray for Dave and Diane as they bring the gospel to the tribal people in Washington. We pray for Harlan and Josie as they bring the gospel to kids in Alaska, living in perpetual darkness and cold this time of year and spiritual darkness as well. Lord, would you uh, give them strength? Would you uh, empower their ministry by your spirit? Lord, would you draw children to yourself through them? Lord, we pray for our community. We pray for revival. Lord, there are multitudes of families around here who are not in your house, who are not worshiping the Lord, who are worshiping some other god, who are under the slavery of the gods of, the gods of pleasure, the gods of money, the gods of the age. And Lord, those are cruel masters. And we want you to set them free to worship the King of kings, the Lord Jesus Christ, whose yoke is easy, whose burden is light, whom to follow is life everlasting. Lord, would you help us to bring the gospel to our friends, our families, our neighbors. Would you bring revival? Lord, would you continue to strengthen this church to Help us as we work together for the glory of Christ, for each other's good. Lord, help us as we seek to love you and love our neighbor. Would you use us? We are here. We are your servants. You have much work to do in our hearts, but would you even now be fit, see fit to use us as your willing servants? We present ourselves to you. Use us how you see fit. Lord, you're a good God. We love you. You've been gracious to us. We boldly ask for even more grace. For we pray this all in the name of the gracious one, our Lord, our Savior, born of a virgin, born to give us eternal life, Jesus Christ. Amen.
All right. So good to see the uh, cans coming in. I think Bob and Sandy even got their can in finally. So uh, way to be Bob and Sandy for that. Um, we are going to uh, sort of return back to Matthew 1, but also to be in uh, books of First, Second, First Samuel, especially Second Samuel and, and so forth. So we're going to hop around a little bit. Um, but yeah, continue to uh, bring in your cans. We're going to be kind of wrapping that offering up here in the next couple Sundays, and, and then we'll gather it all up and send it to Chicago, and they'll send it off to many other places that are needy and in need of world relief, as we call it. And so uh, if you would give money other than a check, <laughs> we don't want a check to lay around the whole year, but then we would save that until next year. So it would still go for that same cause. So bring those banks in if you are of a mind to do that. Well, we are decorating day and we have snow and the Lord suddenly makes it feel like Christmas. Um, it's interesting because I suppose when Jesus was born, there wasn't snow and it was nice out maybe and warm or whatever. They didn't need parkas, you know, and that sort of thing. So it's always interesting. We are looking at Matthew chapter 1 as um, perhaps the, maybe the best way to understand Matthew 1 is it's kind of like the, the entrance ramp into our world. We all know what an entrance ramp is, right? We get on the ramp and that brings us into the highway. Well, chapter 1 here we have the entrance ramp into the world for the Son of God who is going to uh, continue to be God but also to become a human being, a miracle far beyond anything, as Joe said, you and I can ever understand. And so in, in chapter 1, verse 1, we read the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham, and and the author uh, lays out all these individuals. And then at the end of it all, he says in verse 17, So all the generations from Abraham to David were 14 generations. And from David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations. And from the deportation to Babylon to the Christ, 14 generations. 14, 14, 14. Actually, uh, if you want to get technical about it, that last section of 14, I think there are actually more than 14 there, but the author kind of collapses a couple families, uh, generations into one because he wants it to come out. 14, 14, 14. He's, he feels that's significant and, and important. And so we have been looking at various individuals that show up in this genealogy that are mentioned as people who are ancestors of David through whom David came, or uh, Jesus rather, through whom Jesus came into the world. And last week Joe talked about the trickster, Jacob, who uh, speaks to the trickster in all of us who are angling and trying to get a ahead and trying to work things out to make ourselves uh, better off in this world, to have bigger flocks and to have wives and to have all the things that you and I want and need in the world, to play the game, so to speak, in order to get ahead ourselves. A, a guy like, like Jacob the trickster, he needs a savior. He needs to get saved from that. He needs Jesus to come. And God kind of used him to bring the Savior into the world. Today we're going to look at a, a second person, and that is none other than the great King David. David is an example of how and why God sent Jesus into our world. You know, if you want to look at, at David in a positive light, he is really one of the most wonderful and amazing men this world has ever known. We see him in, in Matthew chapter 1, verse 6, and Jesse was the father of David and the king. 
And David was the father of Solomon. And it just mentions him, but he is David the king, the greatest king Israel had ever known. Now David represented everything that is good and wonderful in mankind. You've, you've seen Da Vinci's David, right? You've seen that statue that he carved, and he, he kind of made David to be the perfect man because David was an example of, in many, many ways, the perfect man. In 1 Samuel chapter 16, just listen to this description. They're looking for a new king, and somebody said, uh, one of the young men answered in 1 Samuel 16, verse 18, one of the young men answered, Behold, I have seen a son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, who is skillful in playing, a man of valor, a man of war, prudent in speech, and a man of good presence. And the Lord is with him. Now, isn't that like kind of the perfect person? I mean, this guy had everything. He said, this guy is skillful at playing. He's an artist. He can make beautiful music. And so he is, he is tender and he is compassionate and he is sensitive and he just loves beauty and he can just make music in such a wonderful way. But he's also a man of valor, boldness and braveness He's the guy that jumps into the fight when he isn't sure he can win. He's the guy who looks around and says, Come on, you bunch of <laughs> chickens, let's go and, and get these guys. And he is a man of valor and also, he's not just brave, he, he's got something to back it up. He is a man of war. He is a man of war. So this guy who can make beautiful music, so beautiful that it'll calm the, the insane Saul, at the same time can go out and beat the dickens out of any enemy that comes along. He is brave and he has everything he needs to back it up and he can go out and he can fight giants, he can fight lions, he can fight bears, he can fight, he can fight armies, and he is skillful as a warrior. And then it says... He is prudent in speech. He, he knows just the right thing to say at just the right moment. He's skillful in negotiating in business meetings. And he is knowing just the very best thing to say in your situation and perhaps in mine. And then it says he is a man of good presence. He said, you know, David, he can... He can talk wonderfully, but he doesn't have to say a thing. All you need is for him to be sitting at the table in the room, and it gets better. He has good presence. David calms people down. David helps people to relax and take it easy and not freak out. He is a person of good presence. And if all of that weren't enough, if he didn't have every base covered in every way that a man could be good... Then on top of all of that, it says, and the Lord is with him. The Lord is with him. God is working in him and blessing what he does. And man, this guy is just everything. How wonderful a man David is. A beautiful mix of art and war and character. If we want to know more about David even, we can turn to, for instance, 1 Samuel 17, verse 26, where it says, For he, uh, rather, for who is this uncircumcised Philistine? Who's he talking about? He's talking about Goliath, who had come out to taunt the armies of God. He says, Who is this uncircumcised Philistine? that he should defy the armies of the living God. And so here we see David, a man zealous for the Lord. A man zealous for the Lord. I'm sorry, on that former verse, I didn't have any lines for you to fill in, but you could write that stuff on your, your sermon notes anyway, young people, and catch all of that. He is zealous for the Lord. It's just when it comes to God, he is there and he's ready to defend God 
to the nth degree. And he said, this guy comes out here and he thinks he can shoot his mouth off and dishonor God. Who, who does he think he is? And David is going to go out there and do battle with this guy. So David is zealous for God's honor. And if that isn't enough, 1 Samuel 17, verse 37 says, And David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the, paw, from the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And so David was teachable in the Lord's hand. Anytime anything big happened to David, it wasn't just that thing. It was God teaching him about himself and about David himself and about their relationship and what God was calling David to do. And so if something happened to David, David kind of tucked that away and he said, what is God teaching me? He was very teachable in God's hand. I suppose for some people, God does amazing things. God does wonderful things. They don't hardly notice. They just accept it as face value and say, yay for me. I got this and it happened to me and wonderful and they carry on. They don't learn a thing about God or about themselves and their relationship with God. But David does. David is teachable. When God does stuff, David gets it. So he's wonderful. And if that wasn't enough, uh, <laughs> we are uh, reminded of a passage. I actually quote this from Acts 13.22 in the New Testament, but they're quoting what was said in the old, and God, God said of David, I have found in David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. David was a man. He had a heart for God. Man, this morning before church, I, I came down, I, I, I was getting ready, and I was praying, and that's a, that was the exact prayer I prayed for all of us. I said, Lord, Move in this church, move in the hearts of us all, that we might be people who have a heart for God, that it would be our longing, our desire. It wouldn't be like, oh, we just have to do this stuff, I suppose. But no, this is our heart. This is what we long for. Change us here to give us a heart for you, a longing for the things of God until that happens all the rest of it rarely falls into place. And so David is a picture of all that's good and right in mankind. Sensitivity, yet power. A warrior, yet a man who can bring peace and calm. He loved God and God loved him. If you were to seek to become the perfect person, no better model could you hold up before yourselves than this picture of David. And we might be tempted to say, wow, people are wonderful. They're worth saving. That's why God sent Jesus into the world. That's why our Lord came, because we're such wonderful people like David. And we're worth saving. We, we, God doesn't... He'd really be missing something if he lost us. But <laughs> we know that there's a, another side to David. David is just as famous for his affair with Bathsheba as he is for killing Goliath, the giant. There's another side to David. First or Second Samuel rather, chapter eleven, verse one says this. Second Samuel eleven verse one. In the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel. Kind of an ironic verse, isn't it? The time when kings go out to war, King David didn't go out to war. The time when kings go out to battle, King David stayed in his palace. He said, Joab, uh, you go get him for a while. 
I'm sure it'll be fine. I'm just going to be back here. And so it says, uh, And they ravaged the Ammonites, and they besieged Rabbah, but David remained in Jerusalem. So he didn't even go out to the battlefield when they were winning. He didn't even go out there to kind of be, be symbolically present with them in the fight. He remained at Jerusalem. David begins to take it easy. And that's the temptation, isn't it? When we get so far along or when we've done so much, when we have accomplished certain things, the tendency is to back up and begin to take it easy. But what happens when you do that? 2 Samuel chapter 11, verses 2 and 3, the next couple of verses. David saw from the roof a woman bathing. And the woman was very beautiful. And David sent and inquired about the woman. And one said, Is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Iliam, the wife of Uriah, the Hittite? And so, as David is taking it easy, kind of wandering around the palace, he's up on the roof, good viewpoint for a lot of things there, and, and he sees Bathsheba, and as he recognizes that she is very beautiful, his passion his desires begin to spin. Something begins to rise up within him and something looks at her and, and guys, you know how this works. When you're in the right mood, the right place in life, the right situation, wow, the, the, the sight can be overwhelming. A powerful impact upon your being. And so David, out of those passions, he just kind of asks a question. Innocent, right? Who is that? And uh, he begins to discover the information about her. His passions are moving, rising, driving him forward, leading him step by step. And in chapter 11, verse 4 of 2 Samuel, it says, So David sent messengers and took her. And she came to him, and he lay with her. David goes from having his passions aroused to, to actually committing to an act of sin, actually committing himself to doing what it took to get what he wanted. He commits to the sin and he embraces it, uh, pun somewhat intended. Well, as is often the case in these situations, Bathsheba becomes pregnant Things get complicated, and now David has a problem. He's gone wrong, he's done something that he shouldn't have done, and so now David realizes that he's not going to just be able to send her back home, carry on like nothing had happened, because she is pregnant. And so, uh, what is he going to do? This wonderful David. This man who knows how to talk, this man who has such presence, this man of bravery and courage. In 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 6, it says, so, so David sent word to Joab. Remember, Joab, he's the commander out there fighting where David is supposed to be. And he says, send me Uriah the Hittite. Send him back here. And so, uh, they do. And David brings Uriah back home for the express purpose. He, he kind of makes it sound like, well, just tell me how the battle's going. Give me a report. I want to hear it from you. What do you think? But 
But in reality, the meeting is just a pretense because David wants Uriah to go home to his wife now and lay with her and have sex. And that way, when she's found to be pregnant by the larger population, it'll say, oh yeah, didn't Uriah come back from the battle that day? And that must have, sure, makes sense. But stinking Uriah is so loyal, so honest, so full of honor that he says to himself, is it right for me? My fellow soldiers are sleeping on the ground under the stars. Should I get to go home, enjoy my own bed, my own wife? No, he says, I will not do it out of honor and out of truth and goodness. I am going to stay connected with my fellow soldiers. And so (laughs) David's getting frustrated. What do I got to do? He says, ah, I know. We know what happens when we get drunk. The purpose of drinking and getting drunk is to lower your inhibitions so you dare to do things you wouldn't normally dare to do. And this is what David hopes will happen, that his great commitment to not going home will be lowered and Uriah will sleep with his wife. But even when he gets him drunk, he's even loyal in his drunken stupor. Before he said, no, I will never go and sleep with, with my wife when my fellow soldiers are sleeping on the ground. And now he says, no, I will never go home <laughs> and sleep with my wife. He's just as loyal drunk as he is sober. So now what's David going to do? Second Samuel 11, verses 14 to 15. In the morning... David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. And in the letter he wrote, Set Uriah in the forefront of the hardest fighting, and then draw back from him, that he may be struck down and die. So here's faithful, honest, truthful Uriah. He doesn't even read the note the king gave to him. He said, nope, that's not for me. That's for the commander. I will never look at another person's mail. But it carries his own death sentence. And as you read the story, yeah, that's what happened. They uh, went into battle Uriah gets assigned to a really tough spot. No matter, he's willing. But then they pull back from him, his fellow soldiers, and they, they gave the order to retreat, but nobody told Uriah. And Uriah is left alone, and he is killed. Problem solved. And so here is this brave, wonderful, godly, heart for the Lord man, King David, who desperately pursues the harshest, Solution. The harshest solution. Couldn't they have done something else? Couldn't he have come up with some other plan that would have made things work out? There were a lot of other things that David could have done. He did not have to go here. But once the sin is committed, it takes a life of its own, and it comes upon you, and it drives you as, a, as though you were its slave, because... We are always the slave of our sin, and David is pushed into the harshest of solutions. There are other things that we could say about David and his sinfulness. In 2 Samuel 24, David calls for a census of the people. Tell me, how many people do I have? How many fighting guys do I have? How many horses? How many tanks? How many guns? <laughs> David wants to assess how strong his army is. And this was a kind of a big no-no in Israel. David later admits this was sinful. I should, you shouldn't be just be trusting God. You shouldn't only trust in what you have and what you can do. 
And so David begins to trust his own strength rather than leaning upon God. And God brought judgment in that situation upon the people of Israel because of what David did. And we read that 70,000 men died in the plague. 70,000. So this is David, the sinner. If, if we would say nobody, nobody could match David in his virtue, we could also say it would be challenging to match David in his sinfulness. Both there in the same man. David is a picture of mankind. David is you and I. Wonderful, yet fallen. We are capable of the greatest beauty, yet able to perpetrate the worst of crimes. And this is not just other people out there. This is you and I. People can look at the church and they can complain and they say, Oh, you Christians, you're a bunch of holier-than-thou hypocrites. And yes, that can be the case sometimes. But we also recognize that the person making that accusation is also a holier-than-thou hypocrite. He's guilty of the same thing that he's accusing us of being better than he is. You see, David, this picture of David, this is all of us, you and I. At times, the most wonderful. Have you ever been around somebody who is just, it's just they are the most wonderful person, they do the most wonderful things, they are so kind and so giving, and you just feel good when you're around them. We are capable of that kind of beauty. But at times, those same people can be guilty of the most dastardly things. This is the Advent mess. The other night, Dave was working with the young people Dave Stralo, and he was talking about Jesus and why Jesus came and the fact that people are are in sin and and everybody is sinful. And he he asked them, do you think everybody's sinful? Well, yeah, I guess. And And then he asked them, do you think Pastor Bob ever sins? Oh, yes, yes, they, they could believe that. They agreed with that. And then he asked, do you think Sandy ever sins? No, they didn't (laughs) didn't think that. (laughs) They couldn't couldn't think in that term. No, that can't be true. Bob? Oh, yeah. (laughs) I could see him being sinful, but not Sandy. You see, we we spend a lot of time looking around the world saying, who are the good guys and who are the bad guys? Who's wonderful and who's terrible? But the fact of the matter is, at one moment, you and I are wonderful and terrible in the same person, in this body, in this character, in these habits and in our actions. The Advent season is populated with people who need to be and who long to be delivered from their sinfulness. We know that life is good and that we are capable of rising up to become positive people who bring blessing and goodness to others, but we are also realistic enough to know that we are... um, marred, marked. We see around us a wonderful world with great people, but we notice too the depths of sin in the human heart. And in the end, 
we need a Savior. The coming of Jesus into our world will never captivate us, will never enthrall us, will never move us to worship and to welcome him, this newborn king, until we connect with the truth that though we are wonderful in many ways, at the same time, we are desperately wicked and we have become objects of God's wrath and we need a Savior. The Advent season is filled with the sound of feet running. As soon as we hear a hint that a Savior has been born and a Savior has come into our world, we are running towards Him. We are seeking Him out. That's the heart of the Advent season. Even though David was a great sinner, yet he was still a man after God's own heart. Do you believe that? Can that be true? Can this guy, who is both things, can he be such a sinner and still have a heart for God? How can this be? There were three essential things, and I'm going to say these three things and I'm going to be done. There are three essential things that David did and was that made all the difference in the world, that helped him to be wonderful even in the midst of his sinfulness because God was at work in his life. First of all, he owned his sin. He owned his sin. When God came to Saul, the previous king, and said, you have sinned and you have done what I told you not to do. You know what Saul said? Well, no, I didn't. Well, not really. Well, I had to. I mean, I was pushed into it. That's Saul's reaction. When David is told, hey, there was a guy that had one sheep, and this guy that had 3,000 sheep wanted to put on a dinner, and he took the one guy's sheep and slaughtered it and ate that one, and David said, this guy deserves to die. Who is it? And Nathan said, you are the man. And what did David do? He owned it. He said, yep, I have sinned against God. So he owned his sin, and he repented from his sin. If you read Psalm 51, you'll see his repentance. And thirdly, so he owned his sin, he repented, and thirdly, he cast himself upon God's grace. He said, Lord, I've sinned. I can do nothing. I'm in your hands. He cast himself upon God's grace. Are you a great sinner? Let the longing for a Savior grow strong in you. And then run to him as he comes to you in this season of your life. Let us pray. Lord, we give thanks to you for the wonderful way in which you save us. Save us from being who we are. Transforming us into who you have called us to be. Help us to run to you, O Lord, in response to the sin that we know lies within our hearts. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you and me, sinners, blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before now, before all time, and now, and forever. Amen. Amen and amen. Amen. Let's doxologize.
invite you to stick around for Sunday school. It is the last day of the gift card fundraiser. Button up that stuff. You're dismissed.